Let's go to Romans 11. Uh, while you're turning there, somebody asked, somebody noticed that sometimes in the afternoon I use a bigger, a different Bible, it's a lot bigger. Um, this is a very rare out of print crystal study Bible. They did the first one and they printed 4,000 uh, in 1975, Thomas Nelson. Then there was another printing in 79 and another printing in 81. But the 79 and the 81 printing, they went to the New King James. So this was the only one that they did in the 1611 King James. And um, I'm really proud of this. This was a gift uh, from a pastor friend. And uh, so uh, I love this Bible. Uh, and, uh, but there's a reason I'm using it uh, in, the, uh, in the afternoon. Part of it has to do with age and what you can see and what you can't see. Some of y'all might know a little something about that. Okay, Romans 9, 10, 11 is uh, Paul, a Jew, though commissioned uh, to take the gospel to the Gentiles, that never stopped him from loving his own people and wanting his own people to be saved <coughs> and praying for his own people to be saved. So, but in chapter... Uh, 9, 10, and 11, he goes back to his people uh, because of the things he had said earlier about how their religion doesn't save, their law doesn't save, uh, their works don't save. And those are the three things. And by the way, uh, not only a good Jew, but any good religious person, unless they're, unless they're trained better, for their salvation will either look to law works or good works or religious works. That's not just a Jewish problem. That's a universal problem. But Paul here is addressing the Jews. Now, in chapter 9, the first 13 verses, Paul explains that the Jews have been set aside for the rejection of Jesus Christ. There were many other things that he lists in those first 13 verses. But the final straw, the onion on the whipped cream, uh, was when they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you get to chapter 11, Paul, the master teacher and super smart person that he was, addresses a problem that he knew they would bring up. And that problem was this. Well, if the Lord has put us aside, what about the promises made by the patriarch to the patriarchs and by the prophets in the Old Testament that we were his people forever? And the land was ours forever. That's what he addresses in much of chapter 10. So, in verse 11, verse number 1, I say that, hath God cast away his people? That was the, Paul knew that this would be an issue, so he just goes ahead and addresses it. Hath God cast away his people? By the way, you and I have a completed Bible, this is 2017, and of course we know the answer is no. By the way, Paul says, God forbid, that was the strongest possible language in the Greek that Paul could have used to say absolutely not. You know, we, we, if we're going to deny something, uh, we may use all kinds of vocabulary, but the nicest, strongest way we could say it is absolutely not. Well, that's what Paul was saying here. God forbid, absolutely not. Hath God cast away his people? But now remember, they had never heard anything like the book of Romans. And there was no New Testament writing at that point that they could go back and, and check this thing out. Easy for us, because we have the book. But they didn't. So Paul has to address this. Now, Paul answers the question, is God's rejection of Israel permanent? Of 
course, he says no. But why would they ask such a question? Now, to answer that, we have to go back to two places in the Old Testament, and I'm going to do that. First of all, there, there were two covenants. You know, we're dealing with some of that on Wednesday night. The Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7, which is our base verse, promised that there would be a king on Israel's throne out of the land of David forever. And secondly, and this is a problem for Gentiles, but I'll address that a little bit in a minute. In the millennial reign, there would be a millennial reign when Israel would have its system of priestly worship. Problematic for the average Gentile believer, problematic for a New Testament believer, uh, problematic for those of us in the church age. Um, by the way, I'll tell you ahead of time, I don't have all the answers for that. I have some thoughts, but I don't have all the answers for that. So, that was promised Old Testament Jews, so now Paul says, you've been set aside, so they're going, huh? So, first of all, let's go back to uh, Jeremiah 33. There are a number of places we could go. Actually, there are about six places we could go, but uh, I'll just go to one of the short ones. Uh, Jeremiah 33. <clears throat> Beginning in verse number 19, go to the end of the chapter. I'll wait you get to your problem. Jeremiah 33, beginning in verse 19. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, if ye can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, that there should be no day nor night in their seasons. Uh, in other words, a God promised under the, uh, uh, after the Noah covenant that there would be day and night until there is no more time and that there would be spring, summer, fall, and winter until there is time no more. And that was an eternal thing. And of course, hey, here we are couple thousand years later and still guess what there's spring summer fall and winter there's day and night so god uses that as, as a stepping stone verse 21 then may then may also my covenant be broken with david my servant that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne and with the levites the priests my ministers now i'll talk about that in a minute when i go to another text but the, the davidic covenant which we're studying right now on Wednesday night with other covenants that uh, uh, that uh, Jerusalem will be the capital of the world. Israel will have the promised land and David will have a king out of his line on the throne forever to rule the world. So you can imagine what these people, these, these uh, believing Jews are thinking or Jewish period of thinking when, when Paul all along comes and on and says, you've been set aside. So what about six times? This is what it says in the Bible. Uh, I'll go to the Levites, the priest, in, in, in a, to another text in a minute, because that really, like I say, presents some real issues. Verse 27, as the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured. Now God can, but we can't. Science with their new technology and finding stronger and stronger and stronger telescopes and instruments are finding new stars all the time. We, it's unbelievable that our finite puny little minds, how many universes and constellations and stars out there. In other words, there's so many we can't number them. And then think of all the beaches on all the oceans. Can 
number each grain of the sand? God can, but we can. So will I multiply the seed of David, my servant, and the Levites that ministered unto me. And, and here's a thought from the Old Testament. Um, has there ever been any nation, any group of people on this planet where there have been as many efforts to annihilate that race <coughs> by unbelievers and by Satan? And yet the more that you try to destroy that race, the more they grow. Started with Egypt, which by the way speaks of the world. Started with Pharaoh, which speaks of Satan. And, and there will yet be uh, probably the world's biggest effort to annihilate those people by, by the Antichrist. Can't happen. Because God said it can't happen. If God says it can't happen, it can't happen. And then, of course, the Levites and the ministers under me. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah, saying, Consider thou not, well, Considerest thou not what this people have spoken, saying, Two families which the Lord hath chosen, yet even cast them off. Thus they have despised my people, that they should be no more nation before them. Thus saith the Lord, If my covenant be not with day now, and I have not appointed the ordinance of heaven and heaven, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob, and David my servant, so that I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, for I will cause their captivity to return and have mercy on them. Here's another issue. These Jews should not have been so, uh, uh, surprised at what Paul was teaching. Everything Paul taught them, he was teaching out of the Old Testament which they had. By the way, let me say about that, there shouldn't be anything surprising to any Gentiles about how this world, even our nation, is now going. It's all written in the book. If we don't understand some things and if we are surprised at some things, we're not reading the book. Matthew 23 and 4, uh, Matthew 24 and 5 plainly outline what is now happening in the world and, and, and the way it's headed. So, this is one reason that they were surprised. But the fact is, God said, and, and the only, I've told you this, since, they, since uh, the Babylonian captivity has only been one little king out of David's line crowned at Jerusalem, and that was Christ, and that was a crown of thorns. And that was the end of it after that. But that doesn't mean the end of it permanently. It's a pause. And so that will have the end. Okay, now let's deal with the other thing that they were looking forward to. Uh, let's turn to Numbers chapter 25. Numbers 25. God said that they would... His, his nation and, and the Levites would be the priestly tribe forever. So, again, they were shocked when Paul said they had been put aside. But let's look at this, Numbers 10, Numbers uh, 25, verse 10 to 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, In the house the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, the priest, had turned my wrath away from the children of Israel, while he was zealous for my sake among them, that I consumed not the children of Israel in my jealousy. Wherefore say, Behold, I give unto him my covenant of peace. <coughs> that covenant of peace was to assure the Levites, a priestly tribe forever. So verse 13, he shall have it and his seed after him even the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. Because he was zealous for his God and made an atonement for the children of Israel. The point there being the covenant of peace, the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. Now, when you study the Revelation, and when you study prophecies, there will be a temple again in the millennium. And 
the priesthood and sacrifices will be offered. Now, obviously, a real problem for the New Testament church. Let me say, first of all, let's be honest, we don't have the, all the answers to that. As a matter of fact, we have very few, if any, answers to that. Uh, we accept that. I have a, it's just a personal thought, and don't take out theology just because I have personal thoughts that you'll be a messed up person. <laughs> Uh, obviously, none of that will be necessary for salvation. Amen? So why are they doing it? I, I think uh, it, it will just be a memorial, a remembrance, a, uh, like we do the Lord's Supper, and what is the Lord's Supper? It doesn't save us. Salvation is by grace. But it is a memorial. It is a time when we do the Lord's Supper. It's a time of praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. Amen. But beyond that, I don't have any answer. I have no answer. And, yet, and by the way, neither does anybody else. There have been some books written on it. And, uh, and uh, I've read some of those books. And, and all they do is confuse you. All you do is get ahead. So we don't understand that. The point that we're trying to make here is that the Jews are confused because Paul says you're set aside yet they had these Old Testament prophets. So Paul now goes to explain all that and by the way he uses their own Old Testament prophets to talk to them. So uh, verse number one he assumes the problem, uh, and then in verse number two and three, he goes to explain some things. First of all, he quotes uh, out of uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, um, Elijah, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. In other words, Paul is going to explain to them now their putting aside is not permanent. It's temporary. And in their putting aside, God is going, their putting aside will bring some blessings to other people. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. No, and by the way, foreknew. Now here in this verse, we're talking about God particularly picking the nation of Israel as his nation out of the mass of the nations of humanity. Know you not, or what you not, what the scripture says, uh, scripture says to Elijah, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. That's a quotation of First uh, 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 Kings 19.10. This is when Baal worship in Israel had gone so out of control and was so rampant that the Jewish faith was being crushed. But what said the answer of God unto him? Now this is 1 Kings 19, 18. I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. The point there being Israel is not being annihilated. Just because it looks bad, uh, I still have my people. And folks, we might want to remember that today because we are a people that have television and the electronic media to show what vileness and evil is going on in this world. And, and, and yes, it's bad, but folks, God still got his people everywhere. God deliver us from the spirit of woe is us, we're the only ones left. No, we're not the only ones left. I want you to think about something. Somebody take an estimated guess. How many cities, towns, hamlets, boroughs in the state of Texas? Come on, y'all smart, educated folks. Okay. Would it be fair to say there's at least 10,000 towns of various sizes, and I think that would be a very bare minimum, and yet, and the Holy Spirit, 
through the Apostle Peter said, through the Apostle Paul said, the Holy Spirit witnesseth in every city. Is that not what he said? That's what he said. Acts 20, look it up. All right. So we know that there is at least one, maybe just one, but at least one, Bible preaching true church in every city in Texas. Now, never mind the myriads of phonies. Think about it, just if there's one. And even if that's to say a church of our size, give or take 50 people, maybe a little more, maybe a little more, less. So how much is 50 times 10,000? All right, Tony, you're in front of the computer all the time. She's too sleepy. She ain't about to have a good lunch. Half a million. That's Texas. Now I'll multiply that by 50 states. You get my point? God said to Elijah, don't moan. You think you're the only one. Man, I got 7,000. Folks, God's got a half a million of us just in Texas. Verse 5, even so then at this present time, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. Now, admittedly by the population of the world, we're, we're a remnant. We're a remnant in the Bible usually meant about 10%. Now, don't take, these are relative figures. But uh, uh, even so at this present time, and that was when Paul wrote that about, uh, what did we say, 64 AD is when the book of Romans was written. And look how much population there is now. What is the population of the United States of America today? Approximately 300 million. Okay, well, thank you. What is 300 million? What's the population of the state of Texas? Considering that the metroplex now is 7 million. 30 million in Texas. It's a lot of souls, folks. Even so, then at this present time also, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. Now, we don't know how many Jews are alive today. You know, we know that the Gentile world is winding down. We know that the time is going to go back to the Jewish people. And because the tribe, the 12 tribes, have been so intermixed in the mass of humanity, a very few the Jews know of which ones of the tribe they're from. By the way, when you get to Revelation 7, God knows because he picks 12,000 out of each tribe. God knows. We don't have to know. God knows. Even so then, at the present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace, the Jewish people. And if by grace, then is it no more works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it works, then it's no more grace. Otherwise, works is no more works. Do you understand that? Matter of fact, I brought that out a little bit this morning. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for. In other words, Israel, by law and religion and good works, tried to find salvation. They were seeking, but they didn't find it. But the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Okay, now this is admittedly tough for independent Baptists. But uh, uh, hey, uh, figure out your own theology. The election hath obtained God always has, had, and has today Jewish people that are being saved. Because God said they would be. But he also says the rest. That would be the crowd Paul was preaching to. The rest were blinded. God, Isaiah chapter 6, God made it plain to Isaiah. God says to Isaiah, they have rejected me and rejected me and rejected my word and rejected my prophets and rejected my messenger. Therefore, I will give them ears that can't hear, eyes that can't see, a heart that can't understand so if, if God has rejected them, it's your own fault. It's your own fault. But the election hath obtained it, the rest were blinded. According as it is written. Now, here we go to Psalm 69. God hath given them the spirit of slumber, 
eyes that they should not see, and ears they should not hear unto the day. And David says, let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back always. Not that God is being mean to them. God loves them. God picked them out. He said, well, I love you with an everlasting love. But they've returned the back and turned the back and turned the back to God funny. He said, okay, that's enough. And that's where they were at the time of Paul. But that does not mean they're permanently rejected. That does not mean the Davidic covenant uh, or the priestly covenant or any of the other eternal covenants like the Palestinian covenant. That land is theirs. It, it does not belong to all those other tribes. It belongs to the nation Israel. Now, a precious application to you and I, verse 11 and 12. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? In other words, did God throw them away forever? No. God forbid. Again, emphatically no. But rather, through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles. Amen. That's, that's us folks. That's us folks. For 2,000 years now, they've been on the back burner. And God has what we now call the church age, the age of grace, the times of the Gentiles. When we are grafted into the olive tree, that's the Jewish people, and one of their good branches is broken off in a wild olive branch, that's us Gentiles, is grafted in. And salvation has come to the Gentiles. So their problem became our opportunity. Their temporary judgment has become our blessing. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy these Orthodox Jews over there with their turbans and with their long beards and with their black robes and, and with their prayers at the wailing walls. i got news for you folks. Uh, that's for the camera. Get them in private. They're plenty mad about what's going on, what God's doing. They're mad at God over what God's doing. I'm getting all of us half-breeds saved. But God, amen. But God. Verse 12. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, you understand that? How much more their fullness. That is one of the great prophetic verses in the Bible. What blessings God has poured on our lives because God did to them what he did. How much more, here's the point, how much more will we be blessed when God restores the Jewish people? And Jerusalem is the capital of the world. That's, that's, that, this is a kingdom promise. This is a kingdom promise. How much more their fullness did God not say to Abraham, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed? That is a physical promise, and that is a spiritual promise. The spiritual promise out of that is that salvation is coming to the Gentiles. The spiritual promise is they will have their land back. They, they will have their land. They will have their king. Uh, they will be with Christ, the rulers of the world, as will all believers from all races and nations. Okay, it's a good place to stop. It's 2.15.